How are you guys? Good. I have to tell you that um, I have privileged, previously had the privilege of actually being on some juries in this very room uh, for some studios with uh, Kvench. And um, I have to tell you that I hope if any of those students are here, this is not your chance for revenge. Um, I also have to tell you that um, I'm from a, a very much an architectural family on the East Coast. Um, and I don't want the fact that I ended up as far west as you could possibly go <laughs> as any kind of uh, commentary on architecture. <laughs> and I'm not an architect, um, but uh, it was, a, it was a, an interesting background for sure. But I think um, for this uh, topic, um, speeding muscles, I, I wanted to warn you, uh, convince you that it's not a predictable title uh, for uh, anything to do with uh, sports and dynamism. Uh, it's more to do with um, this sculpture, which I uh, was completely f captivated by um, always. And it's a sculpture that was done in 1913 um, by Umberto Baccioni, who is a futurist. And it was actually a plaster study for um, a brass, uh, or uh, sorry, a bronze uh, statue, which he uh, did slightly later, which is called Unique Forms of Continuity in Space. And that's something that's probably a little bit more well known. But for me, um, really the thing that I loved was this, this plaster study, this speeding muscles. Um, and so that's what I always kind of referred to. And when I was young, um, probably even younger than some of the guys in the studio here, as close as I could get to that sculpture uh, was actually in activity. Um, and so I, I was actually a sponsored snowboard racer uh, late in high school. And, and um, it was something that uh, was really, at that time, that was my way of, of sort of imitating almost the, the dynamism that I saw in that sculpture. And it had just, that sculpture just has such a visceral quality to it um, that I was always uh, fascinated by sports and um, activities which would kind of uh, align me with it. So um, there's a big leap here, but this is about a 14-year leap. Uh, and I went through design school at uh, Carnegie Mellon and uh, came out here and started working for Design Works. And the first car that uh, I was able to actually realize was the, the 2002 Formula BMW. And this was a series where um, young aspiring drivers like Sebastian Vettel or Nico Rosberg, um, they all went through this series on their way to Formula One. And so my job was really to, to make this a BMW. Um, and so that was, that was sort of my first foot in the door um, in terms of a really truly dynamically uh, biased project. This uh, car was 2004, um, the BMW H2R. As Valerie mentioned, uh, we set nine world speed records with it for hydrogen power. And the point of this car was to show that all of the driving dynamics that people expect from a BMW um, can also be perfectly clean. And that was our first foray really in terms of demonstrating that publicly. And so for me, at that time, this was my dream project. I couldn't get much closer to work, you know, worked in wind tunnels throughout Europe. And um, for me, it was just an incredible opportunity. And I really didn't think that I would ever come across a project that would rival this one, honestly. Um, the next project I was involved with was uh, just on a very early stage of development for uh, BMW's Project I, which is the i3, which some of you may know, um, that's out and about at the moment. Um, and um, again, it was just at an early stage, but I was responsible for overseeing the content at DesignWorks that uh, we contributed to this project. Uh, at the same time, I was actually racing myself, and this was, um, I went to the national championships in uh, Road America in Wisconsin in 2010, and um, 
only finished third, but um, it was my, uh, again, trying to mimic that dynamism that I found with Baccioni. So all those projects, over all that time, I found actually kind of came together into this one, the, the US uh, two-man bobsled, which um, BMW worked in conjunction with uh, the US Bobsled Federation to realize. And so uh, to explain why, I, th I thought maybe the, the best thing to do was to just run through like a, a, a quick case study on how this project happened and, and what the design steps were um, to get there. So as a case study, I think the first thing that's critical to mention is that this was very much of a collaboration um, and it was incredibly dependent on a relationship that BMW actually already had with the US bobsled and skeleton uh, federation but it was in this sense much more of a collaboration on a technical level um, rather than simply a sponsorship and so that kind of lent a level of meaning but also a chance to interact extremely heavily with the, all the coaches, the athletes, um, their technical advisors, and have them, you know, contribute to our process as well. This is probably our sport, every the easiest way to explain second, the project. Is a hundred that much closer to a medal, or a hundred that much further away from a medal? If you look at the last Olympics in Vancouver, second, third place were separated by one one hundredth of a second. That's the difference between winning medals and losing medals. Last time we won a gold medal was 1936 in the two-man bobsled. We needed to find the next level of sled. We approached BMW, we cut their understanding of what makes something go fast. First bobsled for BMW, first bobsled for me. Do we have enough time to dial these sleds in? All straight into the wall. I couldn't steer. With this new bobsled, we can win a gold medal. I can't wait to get to Sochi. A special documentary presentation, Driving on Ice, Sunday, January 5th at 12.30 on NBC. So, as you can see there, we had film crews with us <laughs> quite often, uh, and it was already kind of a, you know, a pressure cooker as far as a short amount of time. Uh, and, you know, having it all on film, of course, adds a, another layer. Um, but it was an incredible opportunity, obviously, um, to have that kind of documentation. Um, so speaking of time, it was essentially a two-year process, and we realized uh, two distinctly different prototypes on our way to then a, a series of six production sleds. Um, and so that really started uh, as a process in, in Lake Placid in October of 2011. And what this was, was truly an immersion for me. I got out of my rental car, thought I was gonna come meet the, the bobsled team, and they, they kind of shook my hand just sort of casually and said, yeah, cool, glad you're here, get in. And uh, that, that center picture there is me about to step into that four-man uh, bobsled and be driven by uh, Steve Holcomb. Uh, and the, the guy behind me was Kurt Tomaszewicz, and, I have to say that I, I may have come to the situation with a little bit of hubris on, on my part because I had raced cars and I had done the snowboarding stuff and I thought, yeah, yeah, this is gonna be, this is gonna be great. I can, you know, this is gonna be right up my alley. Uh, and I have to tell you that it, it, it's about a one minute trip and I have never uh, been so horrified, so, uh, so completely terrified um, in my entire life, and, and the, the, the G-forces, they do 5Gs in the corners. It's not a normal 5Gs, it's like an instant 5Gs. It's like every corner is actually, it looks graceful on TV, but it's, it's an impact. And that was something I, I, I just wasn't prepared for, and it took me down to my knees, really, after the run. And it was something where, you know, as a designer, what do you take from that, other than just sheer terror? Um, but you, you, I think as a designer, that's your responsibility at that point to identify, well, why, why was that so awful as an experience? And what can I do to actually make that a little bit better so that a pilot could maybe focus on driving instead of all this vibration and 
chaos. It's absolute chaos is the only way I can describe it. So from there, um, the biggest takeaways from that immersion was that um, there were three criteria for a successful bobsled run. And first is the push, second is the drive, and the third is the equipment. And you need success in all of those, in harmony in all of those, um, to, to be quick, which is really the, the only uh, objective. And so those became kind of the pillars of ideation for us um, to, to go forward. How can we improve the push? How could we make the drive more um, uh, focused? And how could the equipment itself also be faster? And so as a, you know, we, we weren't just taking it from the equipment side, we were trying to address all three of those um, elements. So just in terms of a process level, you can see the, here this first sketch, just super quick scribble on my part, um, is then translated into uh, sort of a basic side view Photoshop rendering and starting to identify sections. And those sections become very important because in the next slide you'll see um, there's actually a, a significant amount of regulations that have to be fulfilled as well. But from uh, that initial uh, uh, sketch to the rendering and then to an alias model, which is a surface, uh, actual 3D surface model, um, was our basic process. But again, I mentioned the regulations, and I have to tell you that it is the most claustrophobic uh, design exercise you will ever experience is trying to design a bobsled, because there are hundreds and hundreds of points that are required, because from a regulatory standpoint, their objective is to make these the same. You know, they sort of want to sit in the basic sausage and call it a day, and everybody's sausage is the same. Um, so our objective was to try to find every potential advantage and efficiency within those regulations. Um, and for me, as a designer, that's kind of one of the most rewarding times is when you try to read into those regulations and find what might actually be an opportunity, um, but obviously fulfill them at the same time. So how do you get into what the shape of a bobsled should be? Um, you know, we're car designers. And um, we had a lot of questions about why they were shaped the way they were or are, and um, also questions about what new could possibly d be done. So what we did was we created a family of shapes which were actually quite different from each other. Um, these are those shapes overlaid over each other, the, the, the five different families. And so you'll see the, the colors are actually the same as the Olympic rings. Um, but um, there were five distinctly different shapes. And you can see some had the nose up, some had the nose down, some had more of like a, a, a boat keeled front. Um, they all fulfilled some uh, of the same uh, points, like the bumpers all have to, those are prescribed where they are. Um, here, the helmet uh, area right in front of the helmet, that's all prescribed. The width is prescribed. Um, it's a little more open toward the front what you do, um, but again, it's, it's a very claustrophobic set of rules. You, you, you really have to, have to navigate them. So what do you do with those shapes? How do you choose, right? How do you move forward? Um, and so for us, the, the key tool in this, and for me as a, as a designer, it's one of the most fascinating times is you, you measure the properties of that shape. You measure the longitudinal forces or resistance uh, and also the, the vertical ones, the lift. And so those are the kind of the two uh, primary measures that we would do. And kind of the cool thing here is you can break that down. You can see, okay, the, the full sled has this much drag and this much lift, but you can also see the different portions of it and you can start to understand what components are creating an effect, and you can also get a visualized effect. And so this is computational fluid dynamics. Um, it's kind of just a wind tunnel in a computer, um, but it allows you to assign a value to a shape, which as a designer I think is pretty cool. Um, some people kind of hate it at the same time because they think it's more about the expression 
Um, but for me, the sort of the meaning when you're, you're dealing with a, a performance-based product is that um, it has to work. And this is how you find out if it actually has some efficiency, which is your, your main goal. So of those shapes, we kind of gave each a fair shake at, at a little bit of iteration, except for the green guy here. You'll see the, the green guy's numbers were, were so bad that um, he, he didn't go any further. Um, but you can also see that we're talking about, OK, the winner is the, the, the black one in the lower right there, 22.100, um, versus the total loser which is 24.33. So those are pounds of resistance. So it's minutia, right? And so trying to find every possible little advantage is where you actually find speed. All these things have to add up into something. And so it may seem kind of absurd to, to worry about just over two pounds of drag, but it's kind of the devils in the details and that's really where the results are as well. So once the black one was established as the winner, um, we did 69 iterations of that shape. 69 different changes and then runs in CFD to understand, you know, are we improving things? Are we getting better? Are we getting better? And hopefully uh, arrive at something which was this final data set uh, that could be a basis to actually make something and get it on the track um, because ultimately we knew that Simulations are one thing, and they're very valuable, especially in the beginning phases of a project, but this a bobsled has to function on the track. That's the end goal, right? So these are renderings of that final data set before we pressed print. And you were trying some stuff with the fins and all kinds of things at the back, which I was very curious if these would work in reality as they did in, in, in uh, simulations and there were some interesting discoveries along the way as far as serviceability and the practicality of things. Um, and before obviously moving into production you have to do the, the actual engineering of the, the cut lines and the fasteners and, and what the different um, panels will be, the, the breakups where the bumpers are, how they attach, also the kinematics of the chassis, um, how everything articulates and you'll see in a second that a bobsled actually articulates in this very strange way. Um, so uh, obviously data gives you the chance to mill things and that's what we did for the first prototype um, and create molds. Uh, it was all carbon fiber vacuum bagged um, construction. Later in the project we moved to a, an autoclave cure as well with, with the um, lamination machine some parts. But ultimately, the point was really, let's get it on the track and find out what we have and baseline it against what the team has already. So this was Park City in March. So it was October to March. That was our development cycle for the first uh, prototype. And I have to, I'll show you this video in a second, and I have to tell you that it's only a minute long, but it was the longest minute of my life watching this thing go down the first time. So this is actually the first run ever uh, for, the, for the sled, and the guy just got in it and drove it, which I couldn't believe, but he, he did.
Hell yeah! <laughs> so, so that gives you a little bit of a sense of how it articulates. You can see that kind of the front moving versus the rear, which aerodynamically sort of throws a major monkey wrench into the into the equation. Um, and you also could probably see how the thing would move up and down the the turns pretty quickly, right? And that, so what you start to realize is that the orientation of the object is almost never perfectly straight. So all of your tr sort of traditional aerodynamic considerations, they go out the window. And so how do you design for, su for this incredible variability of position? And it's never going like this. It's always doing something. And uh, that is um, challenging, but it was also super cool. And I have to say that's sort of one of my key learning points on the project um, compared to some of the other stuff that I worked on was um, traditional aerodynamic approaches don't, don't really work. So um, having a 3D property, an actual sled, also gave us a chance to uh, work more intensely with the athletes. And so this is at DesignWorks and we were scanning them um, and getting their feedback on the handle position and the ergonomics. Um, this is my very favorite photo from the whole project. Let me take this. So that's a designer or a modeler. <laughs> and look at this guy. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is absolutely outrageous. And I mean, he looks like he's got a Batman costume on, but, but he doesn't. And look at this guy is perfectly hollow. Like, I mean. <laughs> It, it's, and the way he's looking at him, too, it's just like, you bastard. <laughs> I mean, so this is, this is a driver, this is a, a push, a brakeman, a pusher. So this, this guy's about 6'5", um, and he can, that's how he rides, that's how flexible he is. And so we were scanning them in position um, so that for any further aerodynamic simulations, we could actually be using real athlete data. Um, and so this is the day of, of scanning at DesignWorks, and you can see a little bit of optimization on the handle shape and things like that. So having a 3D property also lets you get into a wind tunnel and find out, you know, does what's CFD saying, does that, is that echoed in the wind tunnel or not? Um, and that was a pretty interesting learning as well for us. Um, but again, it's, it's really just one data point. The sled's almost never going straight. Your, your, your best chance to find out where you are is actually to put it in a racetrack and go uh, with other sleds at the same time. So um, from there, we moved into our second prototype. And our second prototype was another 78 iterations of that shape from based on what we learned. And so here is the... The new one is the silver, and the old one is the magenta. Um, and you can see the new one fits almost entirely inside of the old one, except for a few different points that we were finding um, made a difference in, in our simulations. Um, different bumper placement, things like that. Um, so it's actually quite a... As bobsleds go, this is quite a big difference between these. So this was our second prototype uh, that actually debuted publicly at, at St. Moritz um, and was our first glimpse of really international competition to see where are we um, in truly the international competitive arena. And so in our first practice week at the national championships, we, were, we had the fastest top speeds almost every run. And so that was when we kind of started to realize we, we had something. And I think the team started to believe that they had something that could be um, really useful. But there were things with that second prototype that we found needed refinement. So they didn't like the way the push bar articulated or latched. So this is a whole new push bar assembly that we did. Um, this is kind of uh, something where sort of the secret sauce of the sled is under these carbon covers. Uh, and this is the steering system. And the steering system is still something that we 
or not really able to talk about or show, um, but I just want to mention it because it's an illustration of how the athletes are so sensitive to the feel that um, they are able to notice a difference or a tweak that you would think there's absolutely no way a human being when they're going 80, 90 miles an hour down this thing at 5Gs could feel anything, first of all, but second of all, feel these tiny, I mean, it's literally like if you added a rubber band to the steering, they would feel it. And that was something that was very rewarding to work with as far as a feedback loop with the athletes, but it was also something that means this has to be absolutely perfect. And so this was our second or third iteration of steering um, that we went to production with. So this is the um, actually one of the production sleds, and you can see it in its, in its bare carbon uh, skin. And I think this is probably the most explicit example of BMW technology positively influencing the project. So all of our I cars are all carbon. Um, it's something that we've, when we've been working with for years and years, um, that H2R was carbon as well. Um, and so this was uh, before it went into battle, let's say, uh, and it's just the bare, the bare minimum. But this is the fleet, um, just ready to go to the Olympics, actually, um, in Sochi, Russia, um, when we had all the graphics uh, on them. And these are just a few sort of visual juicy shots. But this is Sochi. This, is, uh, this was a brand new Olympic facility um, and it was in a spectacular area. And the Russian um, Federation uh, really did an amazing, amazing job to make this not only secure, um, but also a truly breathtaking um, venue. And um, so this was the track here. This was the start in this kind of cathedral setting almost, which no bobsled look, track looks like this. Like, you know, most of them are little gable roof kind of shack things. Um, this is, was absolutely spectacular and it had the, the ability for the athletes to warm up overhead and this, they had this long alley up top. You know, normally they're kind of running around in the parking lot getting warmed up. And so this was on a whole different level. Um, and so it was, a, it was an Olympics to behold um, for me, for sure, and it was an honor to be there. So this is just getting into the track. And it was pretty cool. These, these bobsled races, a lot of them happen at night. So you have this kind of beautiful white ribbon of light just going through a black wilderness. And it was, it was, it's very dramatic. And these are some cool shots that somebody captured. And there's the finish line. So the results, that's really what counts. That's what the project was about, um, was to try to give uh, the US athletes the best tools available. Um, so for the World Cup season, which is actually leading up to the, to the Olympics, um, it's a complete season um, of eight races, and we won 23 medals. Um, we won the, the World Cup overall two-man championship with uh, Steve Holcomb. Um, we, for me, the coolest thing was actually that we swept the podium completely um, of, of all nations. It was all U.S., and, you know, bobsledding is not that big of a deal in the, in the U.S., right? It's, it's a really big deal in Germany or other places as well. And so when the US sweeps a podium, uh, it gets everyone's attention. Um, and we did it twice. The, the women did it and the men did it. And that was, that was very, very cool um, to see and be a part of. So on to the Olympics. Um, we won three medals total. Um, the women uh, won the silver and uh, as well as the bronze. And in fact, we were in line to win the, the gold uh, until the fourth of, of, of four runs combined for Alana Myers. Um, but it was uh, amazing to see her win the, the silver. Um, and the men, I think this is probably the most notable from a historic standpoint. The first time in 62 years that the men had won any medal at all 
in um, in bobsledding, two-man bobsled. Uh, and so Steve Holcomb and Steve Langton here, uh, they won the bronze. And the little backstory that people may or may not have known was that um, you'll see here, this is Steve Holcomb kind of taped up for a battle. And um, the f as I mentioned, it's four runs combined. And so the first two runs happen one day and the second two runs happen another day. And on the first run, no, I'm sorry, on the second run of the first day, he completely tore his Achilles tendon uh, and, and it looked like, okay, that's it. You know, we're done. And um, the guys worked on him until two in the morning and uh, somehow he managed to push that thing and drive it. Uh, the thing I kept thinking about was like, oh my God, he actually did that whole second run with a torn Achilles tendon and he drove it down and I think he was in second place or third place or something like that at the time. And um, it just shows the ability to, to handle adversity for these guys, but it was pretty, pretty cool. Um, and so just actually this weekend, a little update, uh, 2015 on the World Cup, uh, Alana Myers uh, won the World Cup championship and she won uh, six gold medals out of eight races. Um, and the women also swept the podium again uh, in Lake Placid. So that was, that was pretty cool. So in conclusion, uh, this is sort of one of my favorite images just because it gets pretty close to Baccioni there, but we're still chasing him, but uh, I, we're getting closer. Thanks very much. All right, so we'll take a couple of questions from the audience. Just raise your hand. So how much of the technology is proprietary to the US bobsled team compared to the rest of the world? 100%, yeah, it's a totally dedicated effort. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, the U.S. team was, you know, critical to the whole development process in itself, and they brought a lot to the table. They brought a lifetime of experience um, that we didn't have, and um, that's something that I believe should stay with them. Um, and it's literally the the purpose of the project was to facilitate whatever uh, we can for them, and so it's a totally dedicated for the U.S. team. I was wondering if you have ridden in it and if it was less terrifying. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was, I was given the opportunity and I declined. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really wanted to, I really did. Like, of course, that's the poetic thing to do, right? But I, I know, I just knew I wouldn't, this wouldn't make it, right? <laughs> I, I wouldn't. It's, it's, it's a different breed. I mean, these guys are just absolutely astounding in their, in their physicality, and uh, that's not me. But I was tempted. Yep. How, much intelligence is in, how much intelligence is in the object in terms of stresses and sensors, and how connected is it to the tracks? For you to measure performance and position and everything right i mean is it as sophisticated as a car that's one of the hardest parts of bobsledding is getting useful data from the testing because first of all in any competition any data recording is forbidden um, but you could you could do it in in testing right you could instrument a sled but you start to come into situations where you know normally a data acquisition system needs a trigger right a trigger to start and, a, and, a, and a, something to give it its its tracking or velocity. And so these days, a lot of people use GPS, right, for that. But this thing's going like this, and there's a roof over the top of the track. And so everybody has tried <laughs> to get really good, useful, repeatable data. Um, and sometimes we do get good stuff. Um, but the other variable is that a bobsled track is never the same. Even from one minute to the next, there's a change in the conditions. So if you run a control sled, 
and then run your new one right after that, you still don't know if you're seeing a change in conditions or you're seeing a, an actual performance characteristic. And there's the whole human element, which is the driving itself. That's a, obviously the major thing. You can sort of push them about the same rate just for sort of baseline testing. Um, but then there's a whole notion of, um, in bobsledding, the runners are like this kind of black magic art thing. And they're almost like these heirlooms that are passed down from generation to generation. And they actually are the, the runners are the, the athletes kind of uh, uh, economy in a way. And they own these, you know, the really special ones, right? And so if you send one sled down, the only way you're going to get a back-to-back -back comparison is to put the same runners on the next sled and do it. But well, how long does that take? You've got to haul it back up and you're going to get the runners. In. And so getting like re repeatable comparative things is extremely challenging. And they only run f four runs a day because it's, it's just, it destroys you. It's just too brutal. So instrumentation, to answer your question more uh, quickly, uh, instrumentation is pretty difficult and repeatability is even more difficult. How do you actually steer a bobsled? Yeah, good question. So I'm going to have to put this here to demonstrate. But the, the driver actually has their hands between their So when, they, when they're steering like this, it's like sort of like a bulldozer, right? Like back, you know, they're kind of interconnected like this. But the level of movement is huge because they only want what they intend as a steering input to a curb. So if they're getting jostled all around like crazy, um, there's, there's no way that you can have like a super, super precise quick steering ratio because they're moving around so much that the sled would just be going crazy, right? So from a mechanical design standpoint, it's actually quite a challenge because you end up with, they want huge movements in their hands, um, but they only want the runners to move like, you know, a couple degrees at the most ever. And so when you have like that level of movement, it's actually quite a bit of leverage. So from a, from a structural standpoint, you have to build in an amazing amount of robustness that you would not think. It's like, yeah, how hard could it be? You know, it's just runners are on ice. And, but these guys, you've got these huge guys, and they've got these huge levers on this little, little movement. And so getting that kind of any distortion of that whole relationship out of the equation is, is a, a big part of wh where we ended up ultimately. Yeah, I was curious about uh, what the carbon technology that you learned on the I project mm -hmm. and how that influenced these bobsleds. Sure. For instance, do all bobsleds, they're all made of carbon, I'm assuming. Um, well, most of the U.S. fleet, when we came to the project, was, was still fiberglass. Um, not, not all of them. Some of them were carbon. Um, but there is a difference when you're working with carbon in terms of... Um, limited production versus volume production. And so for the I brand of cars, we use uh, a process for the carbon construction, which is um, something that is feasible on a, on a volume level. But on the bobsled, it actually had a higher level of, of um, treatment. Uh, so when I talk about an autoclave cure, basically the way that, that works is there's a mold and there's uh, a pre-impregnated uh, sheet of carbon fiber that has the exactly the correct ratio of or, or amount of resin already impregnated into it, and it's a it's a temperature sensitive impregnation. So if you keep it cool, the resin stays there, and it's just a flat sheet. Um, and then you kind of apply that into a mold, but you then have to exert heat to cure, but you also can exert pressure. So 
Um, some people do vacuum bagging, it's very common, but you really need to get it into what's called an autoclave, which is where it's, it's, you can really precisely control the, the amount of pressure and the amount of heat so that you get exactly the cure that you want. And with that, with that you actually eliminate a lot more voids from the laminate. And by doing that when they crash, for example, it's less prone to have fissures or anything like that, which, you know, carbon fiber has a reputation for kind of shattering. Um, but really depending on, on how you process it and what other materials you link it with, um, that's something that we built into this project. But to answer your question, that level of treatment and labor is not really feasible on a production volume basis. Yeah. All right, maybe one last question. All right. I'm curious what feeds back into BMW from a project like this that mm -hmm. affects other projects that you're doing? Yeah, for me, I, I, I touched on it briefly, but I had never dealt with an object that had to achieve all these different positions and be effective. You know, in a race car, you have a couple degrees of maybe yaw or a couple degrees of squat and things like that. And those are, you know, those are things that are challenges with a race car because the ground plane is very close to the, or the body is very close to the ground. And so that relationship is critical to maintain and all those things. But now you've, all got, you've got these huge variations. And so that was one of my biggest learnings was how do you design for that? And I can tell you the, the conclusion I came to was you just you make it as small as you absolutely can make it. Because, you know, frontal area is one of your primary considerations in, in sorry, <laughs> in uh, straight line aerodynamics. But um, you also have to think about it in, in all the different orientations. And so if you make that absolutely small as possible, um, it seems to work better than like a perfectly, you know, kind of traditional airfoil shape, for example. Um, as soon as you take that airfoil shape and you go like that with it and push it through the air, it's not very efficient. So in, in this sense, it was smaller is better. Yeah. Sure. Pleasure. Thanks.